Good morning. I hope, hope everybody had a good night last night. Uh, I assume the ones who had a really good night last night are the ones who are missing. Uh, just quickly, some health and safety stuff in case there's anybody here who, who wasn't here yesterday. Uh, if the alarm sounds, it's an evacuation. You go out the front door and collect around by the, the floral clock that's around there. If the floor's moving, it's an earthquake. You drop, cover, and hold. Uh, if the earthquake's long and strong or we get notified, notified about a tsunami, then we go out and across the road and up the hill, and the staff will lead us on the correct direction. Uh, toilets are out this door, one pace if you're a male, four or five if you're a female. Uh, and if you want to smoke, go out of the building and a long way away. Right, thank you. Um, so this morning we've got Joe and Tim, and they're representing NZIX. We've got uh, some updates and some technical stuff. Wrong deck. Uh, no. <laughs> Should we convert it over quickly, or I, do you want to do? I'll chuck it up on here. You've got it, yeah. So, sorry, everyone. Hey, it's not cool, my fault. You. I uploaded it. I did what I needed to do. <laughs> so, I did. The one. You got two tabs on. No, no, scroll down, have a look quick. Yeah, got it. Bottom, so that's the that's one. Yeah, that's not one. That is fine. That'll do. Awesome. Excellent. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to be really quick. Tim's got some cool things to talk about. I've got an update on uh, NZIX and kind of who we are, traffic, you know, over the last 12 months, that kind of stuff. Um, so let's go to that slide. Um, so uh, AKLAX was uh, started in 2014 by uh, IA. Um, we had a bunch of peers over in Sydney who said, the IX landscape in New Zealand kind of sucks. Can you help us out? So we did. Um, and our, our whole idea was to uh, kind of make it like a sister association over here and let you guys do your thing. So we did. And that got uh, registered in 2016, just before Apricot, I believe, which was perfect timing. Um, so yeah, basically, we, we run, NZIX runs Auckland IX. Uh, we're kind of here to do good things for you guys. Um, if there's any other things that probably aren't IX related stuff, I'm sure they'll listen to you and you know try and help you out where they can. So this is our usage. So as you can see, it's a pretty big growth uh, spurt. So yeah, massive, um, 63 peers last year, so we're up to 79, almost just over 80 now, I think, as of this year. Um, so the growth is pretty good. And the prefixes, oh, sorry, I did a thing. Technology, love it. Um, come on. So anyway, um, there was a massive spike in prefixes and you can thank Walt for that. Thank you, Walt. That uh, big spike there is Hurricane when they turned on. So we went from about 8,000 V4 to a lot. Um, which is pretty good. Next one. That's our traffic. So it kind of grew a little bit, which is not too bad. 39, 39 gig last year, or 2017, to 71 gig peak over 2018. It's quite an impressive growth, so I think so, maybe. Um, this is a good one. So we have a two route servers. Those people aren't on it. Please get on it. If you don't know the details, email us. We sent out like a million emails about it, and you guys need to do the needful, so please do it. Details there too. What are we doing? So uh, Auckland IX is currently in three sites. Um, and we plan to connect them up in a ring because at the moment it isn't and we kind of need that resilience. So that's number one priority for us this year. Um, and 
hopefully we'll have a few new sites coming up and um, you know, if you've got any ideas about data centres in Auckland that we should be popping, let us know because we'll do whatever we need to do to get more people connected. Um, apart from that, we're looking at a couple other places. Um, Welly is probably on our list and Christchurch was our really big interest, so I think we're going to push that pretty hard, hopefully this year. Dave, going to nod? Yeah? Yeah? Wicked. Um, so if you've got any other ideas of anywhere else we can go, let us know because we're more than happy to investigate pretty much anywhere that makes sense for you folks. Um, that's about an update on the ARC side of things here in uh, New Zealand. I'll hand you over to Tim who's going to have a chat about flows and some cooler things I think. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Joe. So what I've come to talk to you guys today about is using flows for peering analysis and how uh, IX Australia, uh, we are utilising a flow in infrastructure and a technology stack to provide additional value to our members because that's what we're here to do. Uh, brief introduction, um, IX Australia or the Internet Association of Australia as the, the entity, uh, member-owned member not-for-profit association, um, and we run IXs around Australia. Uh, we have some statistics on peers and ports, and we're a reasonable-sized IX. So this gives us an interesting network to attempt to use new technologies and processes to pull additional insights out of. Most of you should know about flow uh, technologies. They go a step further than your SNMP counters and, and uh, broadcast packets bytes, and they allow us to pull new information to derive new insights. And for uh, smaller networks, often that's harder or more resource intensive to go that extra step, whether it be financial resources to pick up a platform, an a uh, off-the-shelf platform to do the analysis, or to build something yourself. Um, when I talk about flow technologies in terms of sampling technology, so NetFlow, SFlow, IPFix, it, it doesn't really matter in this case. Um, the technology stack I'm presenting today is S-flow driven. That's just easiest to do in hardware for our particular vendor. So um, the same concepts and technology I'm talking about uh, can apply to any flow technologies. So as I mentioned, the uh, motivation behind this is for us to derive new value. So we've got metrics.ix .asn.au and similarly for NZ, metrics.ix.nz. So you can go onto that, it's, it's Grafana. You can log into Grafana, see your port speeds and your traffic and see any other members that have opted to have it, that have uh, not opted out of having it there. Um, with flows, we can take it a step further. We can provide people a breakdown of their traffic to other members and show them where they're getting value from the IX and where they could potentially be um, getting more value. And it allows, yeah, the, the breakdown of multilateral versus bilateral versus VLLs, so the point-to-point the -point, um, virtual lease line product we have. And of course, the content consumption. So part of the value we provide is um, IAA peers onto our own fabrics with uh, content distributors. We host caches. And for smaller networks, getting uh, better uh, connectivity to um, streaming video content, uh, can provide a lot of benefit. So the challenges for building a flow infrastructure for us, um, the scale is one thing, so not necessarily the traffic volume, but as much as it's a distributed network. We're all around Australia. We have 35 plus sites, so that's at least one device in every site. Sites are mostly interconnected. Um, most are in uh, rings, as we spoke about for New Zealand IX, that's the desired uh, architecture. So we need a um, technology stack and structure that will allow us to work with that distributed nature. So the, the key points here are scale, transport, enrichment, storage and analysis. And I'll step through each of these and discuss how we approached it and the solution we've come to and how it's worked for us. So collecting at scale, as I said, uh, 45 plus devices over 35 locations, uh, producing S-flow data that varies based on the packets per second and your sampling rate and what your ca hardware is capable of. So we've got to collect this data to start with. 
Um, for those not familiar, S-Flow is a sample technology. So an S-Flow packet would be sort of 1,500-ish bytes. The typical size is about 1,360. Um, you get the packet header and then, or you get the, the summary, you get the S-Flow header plus summaries of the packets that it has sampled. So you usually get a full header. So in our case, it's uh, the end tuple of MPLS, VLAN, uh, and IPv4 packet headers. So there's a bunch of information there that you can use. We're not talking about full packet captures. Um, there's, there's no point uh, for us. The, that kind of value is best done on the peers side of the fabric. We're just looking at the communication between our members and, and in what form that takes. So the easiest way in this case is to collect closest to the source. There's a bunch of benefits in that. Uh, it, Intersite bandwidth you save on. Sure, this is trivial, um, trivial amounts, but you want to remove your dependencies on pushing packets between sites. So the, cl the closest you can collect to the SFlow source, um, it just provides an easier pathway to collecting that data. So in our case, uh, given each IX is an island and they're connected in a ring topology, it makes sense to collect per IX because I've always got a redundant path back to the collector and I'm not having to push flows interstate 40 milliseconds away. In terms of the technology choice, uh, PM account is a very well-known uh, S-flow, NetFlow, IPFix, uh, PCAP, uh, ingest uh, binary. Uh, it's built on C++, I think. So really fast, uh, portable, easy to deploy, and it has lots and lots of knobs and dials. So in our case, each of the IX is pushed to an instance of that collector. That collector could be hosted at any site. You could have two collectors. If you wanted to have diverse collection, if, if it was important enough to you, just push your flows to two instances on two sites. You've got very flexible options. In terms of how PM account operates, uh, you can build aggregates on in, within the binary. So it collects the S-flow data. It can aggregate that for you. So our initial aggregation is across the layer two. So we want to see Mac to Mac flows or port to port flows so that we can say, oh, this port is talking to that port and we have that summary information. We also do a breakdown by VLAN tag so we can identify VLLs on a port as well as the ether type. So that's a V4, V6 split. So once you've collected your flows, you've then got to push them somewhere to store them and to analyze them. Transport gives you an opportunity of building this stack into a pipeline. So you want to write it to a database of some sort. I'll talk about that storage technology a bit later. But you've got to get it somewhere first. And this provides um, an op opportunity to mitigate network disruptions and provide some redundancy. In terms of uh, mitigation, mitigating network interruptions, a client side buffer or a collector side buffer is a good way to go about it. Um, if you were here at NZNOG last year, I spoke about the metrics collecting um, that we do for SNMP. Same deal, a little ring buffer that can, that can fill up and just retry on send to wherever you're sending it to. Uh, in this case, PM account has a built-in buffer, so you allocate a slice of memory and it's able to buffer up your flows and do retries to whatever your transport technology is. You could also plumb in something like uh, RabbitMQ or Redis to, to do the same thing if you prefer pulling it outside of PM account itself. In terms of actually transporting it, we want the ensure right once actually to a central database. Um, if I say ensure right once, a lot of people will instantly think Kafka because it's a bus technology, it allows you to have topics and information and uh, publish and subscribe to that as your consumers or uh, data producers um, uh, want to. So that's where we start plumbing in the buffer and transport. So uh, PM account has Kafka uh, capabilities built straight in. It'll pull out of its buffer or off a RabbitMQ buffer and push onto Kafka. So in terms of Kafka, uh, it's topic based. So Flows get turned into a, a JSON representation. A native JSON is native, native to Kafka. You can put it onto a topic, and then that data can be subscribed somewhere else down along the line to be collected. In this case, if they're uh, 
because there's a central database sucking in the data from the other side, uh, you have the opportunity, or you have the possibility that there could be a network disruption. If uh, there's a network disruption between the um, consumer and the producer, the buffer simply starts buffering up. The topic goes, uh, the topic sort of stops producing data, and you wait until the network is restored. A retry happens, and the data appears back on the buff, uh, back on the back on the bus. So this works really well for even rebooting your database. So if you need to restart or upgrade your database, flows will buffer up at one end, and they'll appear when your database is back online and receiving flows. It also gives you the opportunity to enrich the data. So as I said, building a pipeline with technologies like this give you opportunities to, to do things between collecting and storing. So uh, in our case, we want to know who or which member a flow belongs to or where did it come from, where is it going to. So from MAC address information, port information that is um, available in the S-flow sample, we can then do lookups against our operational state database, add information to the JSON data structure that's on the bus, which can then be stored into the database. Uh, if we were collecting uh, layer three information, for example, the source destination IPs, you could also then do BGP lookups and determine prefixes and ASNs and, and a whole bunch of other information. Just by building this pipeline, you get the opportunity to do that stuff in the future. Um, add a new topic. Actually, yeah, here you go. That's the diagram I wanted. Uh, data comes in on the, the topic at the top. You have some sort of enrichment binary. All it does is it pulls data off one bus, makes a call out to resolve that information or perform some transformation on the data, and then it publishes back to the next, the next topic. And you can chain these together. So I want to look up this member, and then I want to do an IP lookup, and then I want to do this and this and this. And you can, you can structure that all together so that the data then flows out the end in its trans final transformation. So storage. Flow data has the potential to be uh, fairly heavy in terms of the storage requirement. Um, definitely not PCAP level, but uh, when you start looking at the quantity you're collecting and the dimensionality of the data, it, it can get a bit um, large. So there's a few things you want to be able to look at. If you're storing a large dimension of data, it's usually because you want to be able to perform analysis on those dimensions. So now you're talking about a lookup and indexing problem, um, and you need to ensure the technology chosen is right for what you're, the types of analysis you're likely to want to do. Um, fast query uh, for long-term and short-term data. So overflow data, you're less concerned about the last five or 10 minutes. You might be more interested in, show me the last seven days, the last 30 days, the last year. What has been the trend for this type of traffic or um, what's my growth pattern between uh, my AS and that AS or my port and the set of ports? They're the kind of analysis uh, you're going to want to do. After evaluating a few technologies, um, MySQL slash Postgres, uh, InfluxDB, I landed on ClickHouse. Uh, Yannix is the uh, company that produces ClickHouse. ClickHouse is entirely open source. Uh, the way I describe it is Google does their Google Analytics uh, for the web. Yannix is also a web analytics company. So ClickHouse is designed to be a mass data storage for high, dimension, high dimensional, highly dimensional uh, event data. So think HTTP uh, logs. So that, it, it works really well. It's, uh, it has, it's a columnar database. So for those um, interested, instead of storing rows in a file, it stores columns in a file. So it makes performing operations across large sets of data much faster, particularly for the type of analysis you'd want to do with flow samples. Uh, it also has pluggable engines, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, these are just the summary of some of the points I came across with the, the three database technologies I looked at. Um, InfluxDB has recently increased their tag uh, dimension for what they feel is appropriate. I still don't feel that it's right for flow data. Once you start getting into very large um, dimensions, particularly around source destination IP port protocol, it, the tag index volume can blow out. So I just feel that ClickHouse is a better fit for this um, use case. 
The other major benefit that ClickHouse provides is that clustering and sharding support is in the open source version. So very easy to set up multiple nodes, shard, shard your database or databases across them, and it, it it's, doesn't require any sort of commercial support like Influx does. So this is where we're at. Data is collected, buffered, published, and then ClickHouse has a driver where you can subscribe to a Kafka topic. It pulls the information off, reads it only once, and writes it to a database. There's, um, there's a few ways you could go about that, but the materialized views feature is very, very flexible in ClickHouse. If you're interested in the, the deeper technicals of that, their documentation is really, really good. Uh, so I mentioned the flexible storage engine and why that is particularly good for this use case. The merge tree family of storage engines means that collecting large volumes of data in small samples can be dealt with very effectively. So a summing merge tree allows you to collect events. You structure your tables as fields, so these are what uh, tags, if you will. Um, that's not the terminology they use, but it's, it's tags for the purpose of identifying a flow, and then you've got uh, fields or your values. You can set a time period whereby it'll collect the data, then perform effectively a sum on the unique rows. So where there's a unique tag set, it'll then take the values in, those, in that time period, sum them all together and enter one row. So this, is, this means that your aggregation that you choose for storing your data determines the amount of entries you have in your flow database, but it also means the database technology is managing this for you and it's a very efficient means of um, processing the data. So what we result with, this is the data for New South Wales AX. This is the number of flow samples for any given five minute period. There's a few spikes on the graph. I believe there will have been large packet bursts in that five minutes that's resulted in um, either um, a, an incorrect data point or uh, some other anomaly. But what you can see here is there's roughly 3,000 entries per five minute period, which is, it's not so bad. Given the database has at the moment, I think it's in the tens of millions, so 80 plus million rows, but I can still sum the bytes across 80 million rows in under a second. And that's sitting on SSDs. And that comes down to the last 10 months of data fits in seven gig on disk. As I said, you can perform a query across the bytes column in under a second. It's really impressively fast. So what this allows is ad hoc analysis. You can jump to the command line and run queries and, and get the data out, but there are better ways to do it. Um, ClickHouse also has a fantastic API, so you can interface with it via HTTP, which means that you can plug it into other applications. So in terms of what we required, we wanted the use of an HTTP API so we could present the data to our members via the portal. And there's a, also a Grafana plugin because everyone uses Grafana. So I have a quick demo. Um, I'll blow out to that in a second, but this is the Grafana uh, breakdown. I'm storing things by Mac, um, just because I didn't want to demonstrate the uh, enrichment just due to data and, and exposure. Uh, but as you can see, you get a very rich analysis of um, breakdowns. So let me just go to oh, this isn't going to end well because I'm going to have to This is quite a lot of data because it's a two-day view. So uh, be aware loading these points into the browser and you need your browser to be performant, which Chrome is sometimes. And so you can see we've got the breakdown per Mac. We've got speeds and data volumes. So because you're collecting bytes over time, that can be very easily converted to bits per time, uh, bits over time, so bits per second. Uh, and you can uh, perform these breakdowns uh, we've also, 
because we're collecting the n-tuple data based on source, destination, MAC address, and VLAN, you can, in the case of New Zealand data, because I've recently started collecting the flow data for New Zealand with the similar architecture, you can see the ether type breakdown for v4 versus v6, as well as uh, start doing other analysis for our internal purposes. So because we have three sites that aren't connected in a ring, uh, if you wanted to add another side to the ring and shorten the path between two sites, it might be interesting to know exactly how much traffic might flow on that path. So the question is, how much traffic flows between site A and site C, given they're connected by site B? Well, when you're collecting flow data, you can, you can do that analysis. So in this case, uh, Auckland 1 and Auckland 2 uh, peaks out at, at 5 gig in one direction. So, OK, that's fine. We could put a 10 gig leg on that site. Let's do 2 by 10, just to be sure. Uh, you can start to ask and answer some of those questions for um, doing analysis internally, but also we can then break down port traffic for members by VLAN so they can see VLL uh, traffic as well as the traffic to and from uh, other members' ports, which is where I will come back to the next point. So who's logged into the New Zealand IX portal? Of the members here, who's actually logged into the portal? That's a few hands. That's a few hands. We're here to give you another reason to log into the portal. So if you go in there now, uh, what we've built is uh, a metrics panel. You can go in there and start by selecting your service, so that's the second drop down, and then a list of members. And from there, you can start looking at the traffic your service is doing to and from other members on the fabric. Uh, for anyone who manages networks, it's useful to say, hmm, we're doing two giga traffic, what's the breakdown? Where should I be doing bilats? Why, where am I not getting value? Um, so this becomes a very powerful tool for asking and answering those questions. We have a lot more planned coming to this panel, so I'd recommend you log in regularly and we'll be doing advertisements about the new features we add and, and change here. Uh, but it's a, it's a start to providing value to our members on the IX. And for anyone else in Australia, this will be being rolled out through all the other IXs in, in the next six to nine months. With regard to the portal consumption, the way we've wired this up, um, you log into the portal, that then hits a, a small service that basically pulls in the service data, makes the query to the database, processes the data, and returns it back to the, the front end. So it's, it's reasonably responsive. So I think a, a seven day view loads in under two seconds, which is uh, not bad for a database query, a transformation, enrichment, and return to the, the front end. So I wanted to just extend on this a little bit in my last few minutes. If we were to scale up the pipeline, say we're not talking 40 devices, we're talking 400 or 4,000 devices, how would I go about doing this differently? You either have more nodes, more flows, <coughs> the, the increase in the, the flow data you receive based on the traffic in the device, it's not that too much of a problem. In terms of more flow producing nodes, that's where the scale becomes a new thing to manage. Um, more sparsely located nodes, say we're talking a, a global network. Um, say you need to process mirrors of traffic instead. How could you do this differently? So using a familiarity with a microservices or a containerized architecture, yes, I know I use buzzwords sometimes. If you're using white box switches, particularly those that have uh, a decent amount of resources on board, four cores, eight gig of RAM, you can do a lot with. A lot of NOS vendors, are now shipping their OS as a VM on this platform. So there's spare resources there for you to consume. And you've got an interconnect down to the switching fabric, be it at 10 or 100 gig. You can use this auxiliary VM function to drive your collector. So no longer a collector per IX, per multiple devices, run small binaries to do the caching and buffering on box. Particularly if you're running a 10 gig down to the switching platform, that's fine for flow data export. If you've got a 100 gig interface, you could potentially processing, be processing full packet captures here as well. In terms of scaling up, this gives you a micromanagement per device, and that requires a slightly more global view. So with this auxiliary VM, if you treated that as, say, a Kubernetes node, you register a daemon set on box, and that can, at a very large scale, manage this architecture for you, including the networking to the ASIC 
uh, the networking within the VM, as well as the microservices or the containers running on Box. So now you've got, from here, a bunch of nodes that are publishing onto a Kafka topic. So Kafka scales similarly. So you'd have a clustered, a centralized uh, Kafka cluster that all your network devices are reporting their aggregated flows down to. So no longer are you reporting a few megabits per device per 10 gig, you're now just reporting the aggregated JSON flows. And that can obviously be compressed as well. This is how I'd scale it up, given a white box network with that distributed resource. Um, it seems like a fairly nice solution uh, to me, but I'm open to questions and criticisms and, and ideas from people because this has been a developing solution for us. It seems to work, it produces results. Um, I ask you to log into the portal if you have access, check it out, send me an email. If you find anything broken or wrong or something you particularly want out of it, we're here to provide our members extra value and we're always open to suggestions. Any questions at all? Or is it a bit early in the morning? Too deep, too early. <laughs> Ego's always there for a question. I, I am, yeah, I, I actually do um, kind of similar things with Kafka and it's the mm. questions. Actually a question, not a question, and maybe like, you know, interesting discussion, um, Yandex ClickHouse, and you missed the D in, in your slides. So it's, it's Yandex. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's the minor thing. Um, so, have you looked into Elasticsearch versus Cl um, ClickHouse? That's the you know kind of main thing. I've been using Elasticsearch for the similar purposes for some time. And yep. Um, yes. In that, I have a separate use case for uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, the downside I find of Elasticsearch is very operational heavy, um, particularly when you start scaling out to multiple nodes. Um, I don't particularly enjoy poking around in it when it breaks and wondering when it's going to break and, and managing shards and dealing with the life cycle and all that kind of thing. I, as far as in my experience, ClickHouse has been very set up and go so far. It, it, it doesn't seem as heavy as Elasticsearch, though I know Elasticsearch provides a, your basic n-dimensional um, ability to do queries on just about anything. Um, for this use case, I'm happy to work within the constraints that ClickHouse gives in that case. Cool, Re really cool talk. Um, Thanks. Question, did you look at Prometheus and Prometheus's time series version two database with Thanos and Sidecar? Because that just allows you to use any object storage anywhere. Correct, yeah, so that uh, hit my radar after I was down this path. Um, in terms of Prometheus, the time series database in itself is impressive. They've come a very, very long way. I'd like to proof of concept flows into it. I haven't seen anyone publish that as yet. Um, I'd be interested to know the results, particularly in terms of the performance of analysis. However, ClickHouse has, um, you can store a lot of data and do very, very fast analysis. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, Everyone? let's thank, thank Tim and uh, Joe. So now we've got a couple of uh, DNS talks, and we're going to start with New Zealand's Mr. DNS, uh, Sebastian Castro from uh, Internet NZ. Sebastian. Okay, what are we here? Are you awake? Sort of, yeah. Yeah, this is a bad slot between beer and coffee, so it's like, yeah, bad, bad timing, but we'll do our best. So hi, and welcome to the Y2K of DNS, DNS Flag Day. So some people promise mayhem, and uh, that was us in, in, in that mix, uh, and actually we avoided mayhem by doing all the work we, we are showing on this presentation. So. First, how many of you actually manage some level of DNS? All right, like a third. So how many of you have heard of, haven't heard of DNS Flag Day? Uh, a, couple, a couple on the back, okay. So this presentation is for you. 
So, so I'm going to go and cover why there is a DNS flag day, what was the intention, and a little bit back on, because you're network engineers, you like packets and you like diagrams and, and tests and stuff like that, um, to show you what was the intention of uh, DNS flag day and what was tested and what was uh, the, the results. Uh, we did a fair amount of work uh, within .NZ for this and in collaboration with other CCTLDs to check other CCTLDs as well. Uh, so there is a breadth of information. So the eDNS extension comes, was originally written and published in 1999, so has 20 years. And it was refreshed and readjusted in 2013. So basically, we're trying to fix a problem that was intro sort of intro fix a problem that was introduced 20 years ago. So that's in the age of internet feels really strange. Oh, you really have to go and wait 20 years to go and fix it. So the eDNS specification provides a backwards compatible uh, adjustment to the uh, DNS in order to go and signal new uh, options, uh, response codes. Uh, allow uh, responses larger than 512 bytes and some other goodies. So if you're not into DNS every single day, you might find that eDNS is actually being used for NSID. So um, are you familiar with Anycast DNS? Yeah, Daniel is familiar. I don't know why you're familiar with the Anycast DNS. So NSID RFC 5001 is for name server identification. So if you are querying uh, any cast DNS, you can find exactly which instance is, uh, is answering you. eDNS is used for DNSSEC. Maybe you've heard about DNSSEC. Maybe Jeff, Jeff knows something about DNSSEC. In there. <laughs> it's used for client subnet that is actually used by CDN. So the guys from Cloudflare can tell you about uh, client subnet. It's used by Keep Alive, by uh, Cookies, which is a, a, at the moment an ITF draft for a security mechanism, and there are more to come. So with that in mind, the problem that DNS Flag Day is trying to solve is they are out there in the wild, in the internet. Be Please show me your surprise face of servers not following the specs, right? Or blocking answers or dropping packets they don't like and stuff like that. So in general, there are bad implementation of, of DNS, but the other part is either poorly implemented firewalls or uh, firewall rules that are a little bit too sensitive about what they consider valid traffic. So that those co the combination of those two uh, leads to resolvers have to go and send a query with eDNS and then wait for a timeout and then adjust a little bit of the parameters they sent and try again. And if that doesn't work, make another adjustment and try again. If not, fall back to TCP. If not, OK, I cannot do this. So basically, we're blowing out one query into three, four, five with the associated timeouts and, and delay. So that means you cannot go and widely deploy certain features because you have to go and around these bad actors. So with that in mind, DNS Flag Day was decided by the open source DNS implementations out there. And they decided we're going to remove those work workarounds, those pieces of code that do the, the timeout. So this is ISU uh, in their product bind, um, NL Net Labs with Almbound, uh, Power DNS with the Power DNS recursor, and not DNS with the uh, not DNS. So not DNS is actually written by the the top level domain for Chess Republic. And the release of new version is actually happening tomorrow, tomorrow UTC time. Uh, and with the workarounds removed, but that was the or origin of the of the day. But in in between. The announcement, which was around April last year, maybe before that, they gained support from Google DNS, Cloudflare, Quad9, Cisco, and Facebook. 
So what it was expected to be a, a really slow transition, usually the, the expectation is new versions will be rolled out between one and three months. Um, Cloudflare said, yeah, we're going to do this and going to start rolling out the changes slowly, starting from today. Quad9, um, they mentioned they will likely to do a slow rollout, uh, but Google DNS actually made the announcement a couple of days ago saying, we are going to roll out this immediately, and it won't take longer than one week, one or two weeks, depending on the, on the results. So Cricket Liu, probably the name might ring a bell. Cricket Liu is the author of the Bind and DNS book that more, more than a few of you have actually picked and read in order to go and understand about DNS. Uh, mentioned on, on Twitter, you know what? Google DNS is going is on board on this. They get a lot of traffic. They get a lot of coverage of uh, in terms of users. So this is going to sting you. So in order to go and measure the, the effects of DNS flag day, um, there are a couple of tools. So one was written by ISC. It, that's called the DNS compliance testing. And the DNS compliance testing has around 50 different tests for DNS compliance. We are only using nine tests out of that, which are the eDNS compliance, and are the same tests that are available on the website you've seen uh, around the dnsflagday.net website. Also, CZNIC wrote what they call the DNS compliance scanner for DNS zones, so when you have a large number of, uh, of domains you want to go and check, uh, you don't want to check every single domain. You are checking basically a name server, and it's specifically an IP address for a name server. So you can go and pre-process a TLD zone and generate a minimal set of name servers. Uh, and it's testing multiple times. So uh, in, we use that tool, and the testing happens 10 times because um, we've got some feedback from people that, oh yeah, I tested on the website and DNS flag day, and it works, but you're telling me it doesn't work. And it's, uh, we, so we discover, in some cases, load balancers, that they send the query to one server and we, it works, and when they send the query to the next server, it doesn't work. So you can see one works, the, the next doesn't, so this uh, intermittent pattern that is not visible in the, on, the, on the website. Silence. Yeah, I was wondering if I need to be loud today or very quiet in case of uh, headache, but I think we're going good. Let's put into the numbers. Uh, okay. So what I, is Internet and Set has been doing regarding to this? So we started the, we led the measurement of impact in coordination with the guys from the Czech Republic and from Chile. So we started the collections in July 2018. So it's fascinating because we have this picture before any communication campaign or what was the state there and what's the state now. now. Uh, we did a several set of presentations in different conference announcing uh, the, the measurements and the state and be aware and be prepared. And that means we get emails from random people from all over the world saying, oh, can you help me to go and fix this? Um, we did a blog post back in October and AP Nick was really kind to go and promote that and, and spread the word. And also we did a Q&A session with them last week. We've been doing bi-weekly collections on all dot and set domain names since October, and we have a communication campaign going on with registrants, registrars, DNS operators, popular domains, etc. It's been a lot of work and there's a lot of people involved, and I'd like to go and thank all the people because the results are, uh, and I'm spoiling the movie here, the results are good. There. So, if you want to go understand the, the, the test, there are nine tests, and these are sort of a, a flowchart of how different options are added to the DNS query and how uh, they go and change. So because it's an eDNS test, there, there is one path where you set the eDNS version to zero, and there is another path 
your, where you set the EDNS version to one. And you start testing different combinations. So with EDNS, if you use the DO bit, which is for DNS sec, okay. Then if you add EDNS flags, then if uh, you add the DNS, EDNS opt, if you add the opt list, like the cookie and SIDD and other things, if you try different buffer size, uh, and if you use the DNS opt, which is the same over here, but over EDNS zero or <coughs> EDNS one. So some of the tests are more critical than others, and, and there, there was a conversation yesterday at the mailing list about, oh, I'm getting some, of, some errors, but they say it's not critical. And most of the non-critical errors are about the EDNS1, because EDNS1 doesn't exist. But we're testing you if your name server knows that. This click is, doesn't like, it needs to be on site. So, to give you an idea, back in July, uh, we were testing uh, around 25,000 addresses that correspond to 21,000 name servers. And in January uh, 25th, which was last Friday, we tested around 26,000 uh, addresses. So there is not a lot of variation on this, so the, it's, it's a good indication. However, you, we start chasing the ones we know, but sometimes you have new addresses and new name servers added to the list that actually break stuff. So uh, it's um, quite interesting. So favorite exercise for everyone, let's compare it and set with others. So are, how well are we faring? So there, here there is data for CL, which is the CCTL for Chile, uh, CZ for Czech Republic, and ZNU is a uh, new E, which is in charge of uh, the guys from Sweden. So Sweden, New E, New Zealand, and the root zone. And this is the basic DNS test, so sending an SOA query. And you can see the root zone basically doesn't have any errors on that. And the CCTLDs are more or less in the same neighbor in terms of errors. And uh, that's because the root zone is very strict on the technical uh, test. So before you make any change, they run a lot of tests, so they make sure. The, everything is flawless. And you will see the, in this uh, other picture, which is the uh, EDNS0 against the EDNS1 test, that the CCTLD have in the order of 90% OK, but the root is nearly 100%. So this is to give you an idea that uh, New Zealand, uh, compared to other CCTLDs, is not that different. And that was really interesting to find. So if we start comparing the results from July to uh, January, you can see on, in, on the different test by name server, you can see a little bit of improvements, so half a percentage point, one point, two points. And the biggest improvements are in the EDNS1 testing. So people that were failing the EDNS1 test now they're passing the EDNS1 testing. Mainly because there were some device in the network that was misconfigured. But let's get into the, so that's the name servers, that's the addresses, let's get into the domain status. Uh, and one of the feedback that, that was around the industry is the, the straight test by, written by ISC was a little bit too dry, it was difficult to understand. What would be the effect of me failing X or Y test? So the guys from CSETNIC, uh, actually Peter, Peter Spasek, which is uh, the, um, the developer of not DNS, uh, created this tool where every domain name is fitted in four st uh, states. So state number one is okay, where all the DNS tests are okay, a domain name can be in a compatible state where none of the EDNS tests produce a timeout. So they might return something slightly different from what is expected, but no, not a timeout. High latency, where some of the name service addresses generate timeouts, and dead, 
where all named servers addresses generate timeouts. The high latency state is super interesting because we found some named servers that have 10 addresses and eight of them won't work, but two of them will. We found name servers that have IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, and the IPv6 addresses work, but the IPv4 addresses don't, and the other way around. So there is a lot of combinations in, in there. And, and the rules that you will see are permissive. So permissive is how the DNS resolvers are working up to date, and a strict how the resolvers will work when those workarounds are removed. So if we go back to the compliance analysis of this uh, CCTLD symbol, you can see a completely different picture. So you can see uh, that CL and CZ have high levels of compliance back in, uh, that is July data, and New Zealand is yes, around 35% and a few compatible. So there's a few strange things, but in total you will see it's around 75%. So 75% of the domain names are good. And then, again, you start seeing like 2% uh, of the domain names will uh, ha having high latency and 13% of the .NZ domain names being broken, dead. This is July. So we had some work to do definitely on, on that. But if I show you what's been the evolution of the campaign and the results, you can start seeing uh, how it changed. So this uh, like teal line is the okay category, which was in 35%. And on the test we ran last Friday, you're seeing it's over 70%. So there, was a, there, there were a lot of people going fixing domain name. And in the same way, the, the compatible ones, they drop, but the high latency and the dead, they don't see a lot of change. And it's because of the scale and, and the caveats that is with the collection. The caveat of the collection is not all domain names marked as high latency or dead uh, are because they have EDNS brokenness. There's a lot of name servers out there that uh, the name server itself are they have misspellings, broken IP addresses, name servers you cannot resolve, etc. lame delegations. So um, you have to go and filter out, oh, which ones are these affected by EDNS? And when we see that, you see we, we went from around 8,000 domain names dead to 800, so 90% drop. And for the high latency, we started on over 4,000 and now it's slightly under 4,000. However, we tested this yesterday because um, we, we reached the point where I stopped showing plots and I started telling you the juicy stuff, so the, the gossip, gossiping. And, and we ran this yesterday and actually uh, I think we are in the 500 uh, domains that will be dead. So it's a massive, massive drop, and that's going into a, in a, into a press release today. So how we managed to go and, and remove that number, uh, fix that number of domain names? So in the initial list of domain names, there were a bunch of GOVT and set domain names. Uh, I won't tell you which ones, but there are some really important in there. There were four or five banks, and up to the testing last Friday, there were still four or five banks, and they didn't show up uh, last night, so they, they were, were fixed this week. There, uh, there is a very important consultancy services company that we we're trying to go and reach and reach out, and they're still affected, so good luck with that. <laughs> there, there was a set of newspapers that were aware they are aware, but they haven't fixed it yet. And we reached to registrars, so we gave every registrar, this is the list of your domain's names are going to be affected, go and fix it. We went to DNS operators, so trying to go and find the email address of the right people in a DNS operator, even 
big or small was painful. We went through registrants to go and find it's like, what are you talking about? What is DNS? <laughs> uh, we, we used the, the Slack channel at NZNOG, and thank you very much for those who reached me, uh, and we managed to go and sort out some, of, some domains. So I love the whispered network of NZNOG because you go and ask someone, and uh, he will know someone, and you get uh, far more efficient than routing, even. Um, so great, and here is a list of culprits. So the black you see is, ah, they were affected by EDNS brokenness, and when they turn move into white, that means they fixed it. So you see clear over there in paradise, they were aware around, between August and October, they fixed their stuff. You have a DNS pod in there that is still broken. You have Ali DNS that is still broken. Uh, Icons was on the, on the list, and they fixed it between some point in December. Uh, QNET AU, we send them an email, and they fix it between December and January, et cetera. So this is a, just, a, just a sample. Uh, it's not the full list. The full list is around 1,500 uh, different name servers. So here's the juicy stuff. So get out the coffee, the tea. I don't know how uh, you like to go and cook, I don't know, some cookies. So we got an email from, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to type. How much time do I have, like five minutes? Yeah. So we got an email from uh, uh, an operator saying, you know what, I'm using Windows DNS server and it's failing my test. What can I do? Can you go and tell me how to fix it? And the answer after talking with ISC was, you're screwed, Windows doesn't follow the, the <laughs> <laughs> they don't follow the, the protocols that we've been trying to have them fix for years. They don't, they run at their own pace, so, um, sorry. And this person went back to Microsoft and raised a ticket. And the people from Microsoft Asia Pacific contacted me telling me, can you go and tell us more about this? We don't know, <laughs> really. So we pointed them out to the right person in, in the headquarters at Microsoft who's in charge of DNS. Uh, the large DNS resolvers rollover plan, so we start asking Cloudflare, Quad9, and Google have their own public announcement about how it was going to change because we were getting some resistance of people saying, you know, this is going to take months to fix, so we are not in a hurry. But when we started finding out that Cloudflare was planning to go and do a, a slow, sort of a slow rollout in Quad9 and these bigger uh, DNS operators, it's like, you're gonna get a sting on the same day, be prepared. So that generated a sense of urgency. We have large authoritative DNS reaching us out. We got an email from Alibaba. They run the Ali DNS uh, saying, you know what, you're, you're telling me these tests, are, I'm failing these tests and I don't un understand because I'm doing this interpretation on the standards and then we have to go and prepare them a response of, you know what, the standards have been changing for the last four years, so what you think is right is no longer right, and they say, oh, okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try and fix it. So if we fix Ali DNS on that list, probably we get rid of all the broken domain names. There were some operators confused. Oh, we don't know what, what, what is DNS, we don't know how to fix it. Uh, can you tell us more? So we have to go on through the process of um, so, sort of diagnosing with them, ah, this is failing because of this. We got an email from someone saying, you know, I'm using Bind 9.8 and I'm failing the test. And I went back and told them, you know, 9.8 was stopped being supported around 2016, so maybe it's time to go and do an update. Um, we got op uh, operators saying, you know, I I'm using Infoblox, or I'm using Nominum, I'm using this m really modern and shiny device, but I'm still failing the test. And it's like, do you have a DPI firewall in front of it doing um, 
what's the name? So in Juniper, they call it the LLG, right? The LLG. And they said, mm, yes. Uh, so that's the reason. So if you go and fix, you go and check the documentation. And in between, uh, discover that some of the appliances from F5 were problematic. Some of the appliances from Checkpoint were co uh, complicated. The, some of the Juniper, some of the options of Juniper were um, outdated, so fascinating. And we got an angry mail saying, I have 300 domain names, why you didn't tell me about this sooner? And it's like, we've tried to reach you in multiple ways. We're really sorry we couldn't reach you, but you run DNS services. It's quite of, you should be kind of try to follow go and trend what is going on. So, but we deactivated that. We have an com awesome communication team. So, to finish, right on time, it was really hard to reach some right of the people, uh, the right people at uh, some point, and we had conversations with DNC at the Domain Abuse Forum that we might follow up creating a DNS operator forum for New Zealand. So, with I don't know, someone is in trouble, they need help, they can go and reach the right people. Uh, I have to thank the team at the Internet and said and DNCL for this. So the comms team reaching out the right people, the channel man manager, tech services, Brent was here and his team by, because basically it was at some point ringing every single domain name. Are you aware of this? You're gonna break uh, starting from this day. This is sensitive, please go and make, take action. And in the process, we set the example for all the CCTLDs to follow. So um, some big CCTLDs, so the Australian, once we made the presentation, they started following up and doing their, their own testing. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, Brazil, uh, some other small CCTLDs in, in different regions. So um, there have been some active work on this. So, gracias. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess we have some time for questions. I don't want to steal Daniel's time. Over there. Yeah. Uh, what of the tasks actually show the voice results in the program? Ah, it was the EDNS. Slide 15. On this one, was the worst one? Ah, the opt list. That one. Do you know what happened? So the passing the opt list is super tricky because um, the opt list includes options that are created 10 years ago and some options that were created two years ago. So for example, if you're in the cycle of using Ubuntu 16, Ubuntu 16 is carrying uh, Bind 9.11, if I recall correctly, and Bind 9.11 doesn't support cookies, which is fine because uh, Bind 9.11 wasn't created, it was a, it's a release before the standard. So they will fail that test, so they won't count as okay. But it's harmless at this stage. So my, my guess in, the, in, in that case is uh, by variability of uh, software version, they didn't pass all the tests, but they failed one or two, and they won't co be counted as okay. So the compatible uh, test is, is fine. It's not going to be a, a, a problem. Uh, that means the, some of the, the answer, some of the flags in the answer are not completely kosher, but they don't, won't generate a timeout. So the, the whole process of the NS flag day was let's avoid domain names falling into the, the ground. 
but they're still responding. So they don't, not dropping the packet, the traffic will continue to flow. Yes, yeah, so Amazon is one of those uh, big operators that are really hard to go, they have their own pace. Okay, I think we're gonna move yeah. on now. So Sorry, thank you very Daniel. much, <laughs> So uh, this is not only the DNS slot, it's also the Internet NZ slot. So now we have uh, Daniel, who's also gonna talk about security. Okay, um, sorry, Sebastian took all my drunk uh, hungover jokes, so there's gonna be no jokes in this talk. Um, this is a fairly dry talk. Um, so uh, basically I just wanna to talk to you about, uh, Sebastian just covered a technology that's been around for 20 years and still is not particularly well covered. Um, so I'm just gonna cover some upcoming technologies, you know, new technologies, new technologies in DNS um, I think operators need to be aware of. Um, even if you don't think you're really a DNS operator, uh, it's required to get on the internet, so you're a DNS operator. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly do a, a refresher on, um, on the terminology so we just all understand each other. Okay, so over the last 30 years, DNS hasn't really changed architecturally in any way. The only changes to the specifications have just added um, features and abilities to it. Um, this is the sort of global um, simplified view of kind of what it looks like. Um, the stub resolver, uh, as we refer to it, is something you would see inside the operating system. Um, so uh, that could be like your web browser, could be glibc, um, could be stubby, uh, I don't know what Windows uses, whatever garbage that is, um, or Mac OS's um, uh, MDNS responder, which is pretty not great as well. Um, next one is the uh, caching forwarding server. Um, that's generally whatever crap your, oh, sorry, I'll just cover what it does first. Oop, no. So uh, it basically takes requests from the stub resolver or whatever's uh, another caching forwarder below it, takes the question and literally just forwards it upstream. So it just takes the question, passes the question on, gets the answer, passes the answer back. Um, examples of that are whatever's running on your CPE modem at home, um, so probably DN DNS mask, um, systemd resolve D kind of does that, stubby kind of does that, they're a more uh, localized version of a caching forwarding server. Um, and it's not uncommon to have layers of caching forwarding resolvers between you and um, a caching, uh, sorry, a, a recursive caching server. Okay, and so then we have the recaching, uh, recursive caching server. So this is a much more fully featured DNS server. So it goes out, does a, uh, and knows how to resolve a domain all the way from scratch um, by itself. And generally this is at the ISP, some of the enthusiasts among, among you may be running your own authoritative name service at home or whatever, um, but that's generally where that's located. Um, and some examples of that are things like bind, unbound, um, or power DNS or whatever. Okay, so that, and then of course at the far right there uh, we have the authoritative name servers. So if you're a DNS operator, um, you're TLD operator like this guy, um, or the root servers or whatever. Okay, so with that covered, um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is QNA minimization. Um, it's a privacy enhancing technology. So um, uh, it's implemented at the recursor and uh, covers all the communications between the recursor and the authoritative name servers um, on the internet, and essentially the idea is that it strips down to the minimum number of labels it needs to query per name server so it doesn't leak what it's querying. So with QName minimization disabled, um, with a recursive caching name server from scratch, um, it will query the root servers with the whole record that it's looking for. So in this example, um, you know, dub, 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 domain.nz, it goes, hey, what's the A record for that root servers? And they'll be like, ah, ask this other guy, the TLD, and the TLD will go, I, I don't know, ask this other guy. But at each stage, the root servers and, and then the authoritative name servers in that chain get to see the whole query that's being asked. Um, so with QNA minimization, what it does is it strips down as many labels as possible and understands the DNS hierarchy so it minimizes those questions and it doesn't ask for what the final record type will be until it gets to the leaf node. Um, so you'll see it's asking for the name servers until it gets to the final name server and it gets its final answer. There are some tricks to implementing that. You can run into problems with um, 
uh, IPv6 reverse um, PTR records because they have super long chains of labels. Um, so there are some shortcuts that they'll, they'll do. If they keep on getting NS replies, they'll just go, okay, I'm asked the final question if, it, if, the, if the answer's remaining the same. Um, and also, um, as, as Sebastian covered, people write terrible bits of software that don't understand when you just ask for an NS record. That actually happens. Um, so recursive name servers that implement this, um, unbound, not, and um, bind is coming soon. Um, okay, so certificate authority authorization. Has anybody actually heard of this? One guy, two guys, so, or oh, two, two people, three people, um, and four people, sorry. And um, so this is mandatory, and it became mandatory in 2017. <laughs> Um, so its area of influence is um, for DNS operators and for um, certificate authorities. So essentially what it allows you to do is in your, in your zone, it allows you to specify what CAs are allowed to issue certificates for your domain. Jeff's shaking his head, but we'll talk about it afterwards, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, it essentially allows you to publish a list of CAs that are authorized to issue SSL certificates for your domain. Um, you can see here that it did become mandatory um, for CAs to validate before they issue a certificate that they're allowed to validate for your zone. Um, and you see here it became mandatory and everybody, uh, we can see that traffic at our name servers, people querying for CAA records. Um, this is what it looks like. Jess put me way off now. <laughs> no, you're fine. It's, I'll get you back. <laughs> okay, so um, this is what the records look like. Um, so you just put in um, uh, issue and you're saying let's encrypt is allowed to issue CAs for me um, you can also specify who's allowed to issue wildcards and also you can specify a point of contact for security issues so if a CA keeps on getting requests for signing certificates for your uh, domain uh, and they're not authorized for it they can report that to the point of contact if, if they so wish or for whatever reason um, and I had a yeah so that's pretty pretty useful and, oh yeah, that was another point, yeah. So this is not done in the browsers at any point. So the browsers never check these records, it's only implemented by the CAs, which is kind of useless. Um, right, so DNS security. <laughs> DNS security, um, this is a more contentious one. Um, I'm a firm believer, and if you don't believe in it, um, meet me afterwards and we can have a, a, a thorough and comprehensive chat about it. Um, its area of influence is around about here. <laughs> um, I'll quickly bust some this around it. It's a method for cryptographically verifying data in DNS. It is useful, but it has nothing to do with privacy and it's not a panacea of security, okay? All it's letting you do is verify that the records that were put in the zone are the record, you can verify that those are the records you received. That's it, that's all it's doing. So. Obviously, since where it's deployed is quite a few different places, I'll cover them in bits. So the first bit here is recursive caching name servers. Um, New Zealand's done really, really well. So using APNIC's own numbers, 60% um, of New Zealanders are, pre are behind DNSSEC validating recursive name servers now. So if you sign your zone, you'll be, you'll, your 60% chance of being protected. Um, Australia, which is where APNIC's from, do a much more worse job, and they're around 23%, along with the United States. Um, we're about equal with the EU, um, but we're way behind Bhutan with 86% uh, coverage. Um, if you're on this list, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, there are a few notable absences from that list. Um, either you were too small and your samples were too small for me to, to really be um, confident that you were covered. I also didn't put you on the list if you were using Google DNS servers, just handing those out to your clients. Um, yeah, but you'll notice there are a couple of absences. Load <coughs> <of> phone. <laughs> and, sorry, I think I picked up a cough from the, the <laughs> NCSC guys, yeah. <coughs> Focus. <laughs> Okay, so um, if you wanted to deploy um, validating recursive uh, name servers now, um, Microsoft has been supporting it since 2012, so you should feel bad. 
Um, Bind, everybody's been supporting it. Look, even DNS Mask has working support since last year. Um, yeah, so there's, there's no real reason not to be able to do it. Um, if you're running software that's older than that, well, that's your problem. <laughs> okay. Um, the next step is uh, in the authoritative namespace. Um, so if you're operating DNS zones or signing zones, um, I think this is a space where uh, there's still a lot of inexperience with it. Um, so I think the software is getting a lot more bulletproof and quite solid. Um, but people just, they haven't signed a zone before. They don't know what to expect or what to look for when they're doing it or how to debug it. I think that's the biggest problem uh, in this space. In fact, this, uh, yeah, oh, I don't, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, so if you want to do signing, there's a whole bunch of software. Um, Inflowbox and um, Secure64 are just application boxes you can stick in your network and go, I got zones I need to sign, and they'll go ahead and do that. Um, Microsoft DNS um, actually supports, like, uh, supports it pretty well, actually. It, they even support ECDSA, um, which is pretty excellent, and they've done that since 2012, and it's basically a tick box when you're setting up zones. Don't ask me how to do that. I just read one of those Stack Exchange articles that said it's pretty easy. Um, okay, and so, uh, and so the final part of that is the stub resolver support, and to be honest, that's probably the weakest part of the ecosystem. Um, it's not as important as people make it out to be, because if you're behind a recursive caching name server, you get that protection anyway, and you can pass that on to your clients. Um, part of the problem with that is uh, your applications, uh, it's no way of signaling back to your applications that the records they've got have been validated in any way. And um, that's really one of the uh, main failing points of um, operating system developers. Um, they the standards for doing that and the APIs for working within the operating system for passing that data back, just, I mean, there's, there's been some sort of half-baked half solutions. They'll pass back like, oh, yeah, I got an AD flag, so it must be fine, right? Like that's, that sort of level of, of reporting back. Um, but that said, it is getting better. And um, so uh, the supporting clients at the moment are Windows 7 will actually do uh, understands validation. Um, system D resolve D is a full validating um, DNS uh, DNS uh, stub stub resolver. Um, glibc is semi aware, but it's not particularly good. And and then the stubby, which runs as a local um, name server, um, but of course uh, it can't pass back that validation data back to the clients. So um, yes, yeah, system D seems to be on the right track, which it pains me to say. Okay, so the um, next technology, which kind of depends on DNSSEC, is aggressive NSEC caching. Um, Jeff's done some good work on that, and um, uh, APNIC actually funded some work um, from ISC to get that built in. Um, it's kind of in this area here, so it's implemented in caching, uh, recursive caching name servers, um, and how it talks to authoritative name servers. Um, anybody here understand how NSEC works? Okay, yep, Jeff. Yeah, okay, three people. Anybody understand how NSEC 3 works? <laughs> okay, even less hands, but yeah, it's about, it's about right. Um, and probably half, uh, including me, I still get confused about it and uh, need, to look, need to look up the RFCs every once in a while for some corner case. Um, essentially what it is, is uh, when you sign your zone, you have to prove that certain records don't exist. So what DNSSEC does, it creates records that say, from this record to this record, there's definitely nothing in the middle of it. So when you query it with your recursive name server, you'll get back, oh, for, a, for an existing record, you'll get back an NSEC record along with it, or if the record doesn't exist, you'll get back that NSEC record. But then you can cache that record and say, well, I know nothing exists between here and here, so there's no point even asking the question. So it's great for performance. It's great for um, authoritative name servers because they don't have to worry about um, answering as many questions. Um, the root servers, this is one of the technologies they're looking to help out the root servers to reduce the amount of garbage that they see um, at the root as well. Um, so yeah, it's pretty good uh, in that respect. Um, so currently supported in uh, Unbound, Bind, and um, Not Resolver. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next couple of technologies I'm gonna cover are uh, a little bit of what keeps me up at night, because these are a bit more problematic and something that's gonna be affecting um, D, uh, operators, network operators, and especially enterprise operators, okay? 
So the first one is the least problematic of the two. That's DNS over TLS. So this is a privacy protecting, well, that's not me. <laughs> No, 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 next one up. Keep going up. No, no, more, more. Yeah, previous topic. Keep going up. Uh, yep, slide 37. Yep, perfect. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so this is a privacy protecting uh, protocol, and essentially what we're doing is we're just taking DNS packets and wrapping them in TLS, and that's it. Okay? Um, it's uh, standardized, it's running over port 853, um, so it's not gonna be running over port 53, so you can tell um, that it's running on your network. Uh, configuration is just an IP address, so you can uh, opportunistically attempt to see if servers are running it, so if you receive a name servers uh, via DHCP or whatever, you can just probe those servers to see if they, they're running um, DNS over TLS. And you can also configure it strictly and say like, you, uh, the certificate must be validatable as well to make sure you're talking to the, to the name server you expected. Um, it, it really is just DNS um, using TCP over TLS. Um, of course, um, validating certificates is still the hard part of it. Uh, in terms of support, Android 9 does it by default already. Um, if you want to run it on your local operating system for desktops um, or laptops or whatever, um, Stubby you can install, and Systemd Resolve D also su now supports it as well which also pains me to say, they're actually doing a pretty good job at that sort of thing. Um, from the resolver side, uh, if you wanted to deploy it on your network, um, you've got unbound, not in uh, DNS dist, and if you check the dnsprivacy.org website, they have examples on how to configure Nginx and HA proxy to act as, fr act as front ends to just pass the queries through to uh, other name servers. And of course, we have supporting cloud services such as Quad1 and Quad9, and it's interesting to note that DNS over TLS is supposed to be a privacy protecting uh, protocol and, and Google's not on that list. Okay, the next one is a bit, is I think is probably the worst of, of all the technologies and this one is DNS over HTTPS and the browser, browser vendors love this one because they think everything is HTTP and HTTPS so it's just another one of those technologies that they can use. So it's error of effect is this Right, so no longer does it care about what your operating system's doing, the browser runs its own resolver and it talks directly to whatever name servers have been configured in the browser or the browser vendor thinks you should be using. Kind of like a search engine. And I can see in enterprise this is gonna make life's people, uh, people's life hard because it suddenly gets turned on in browsers like, uh, well, I can get to the website of my browser but you know, my application can't connect to it or, or vice versa. Um, or one browser can get to it and the other browser can't get to it. Or I can't get to it anymore, I can't get to the internal websites anymore because I'm using a name server that's out in the cloud somewhere rather than the local resolver which knows about my local domains. Um, the bullet points are the features. Um, it basically turns DNS into a REST API. Um, the specification is essentially taking DNS packets, base64 encoding them, and then pushing them over a REST API. Um, provisioning is difficult. You can't do it using um, DHCP name server IP addresses because the configuration is a URI, so it has to have an API path on it as well. Um, so it's gonna have to be directly configured in browsers somehow. Um, of course, it has the same problems with um, auth authentication um, because you have to be able to verify the CA, uh, the certificates of the, of the, um, of the name servers. Um, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be using HTTP2 as well, um, which I don't know if many people are aware of that, aware of this, but um, HTTP2 supports running over UDP, over port 443, um, which is gonna be exciting for lots of people. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of gonna be difficult. But in terms of support, I think what's interesting is that it's already supported in Firefox and Chrome. Um, Firefox only bake it into their nightly builds and they don't actually use the results of the queries, it's just used for performance testing to see if it's any faster. Firefox have also baked in Cloudflare, and that's the only DNS provider you can use, I think, at this stage. I don't know if they're gonna provide some sort of configuration uh, interface to it, but they, they haven't decided whether or not they're gonna turn it on or how they're gonna let users enable that yet. Uh, the next one is Chrome. Chrome has, Chrome has it built in. Um, it's 
doesn't have any UI or way of configuring it yet, but there is a pull request in the queue to enable that. And I think that's going to be the one that everyone's going to be uh, going to affect be a people about uh, affect people because how cro uh, Google decides to do it is going to affect everybody. Because if they say, okay, well, it's just going to go to our our web properties and uh, we're just going to do it by default now because we believe in user privacy, um, then you're just you're just not going to know, and uh, lots of people are running Chrome. Uh, and curl runs uh, curl curl supports it by the way, so great. Um, you can also run local proxies as well, which will wrap your queries in this and push them over the, um, push them up to whatever configured um, uh, server you're using. Um, if you wanted to run one, uh, you can use DNS dist or DNS crypt. You can just run a Lua script under Nginx as well, which is um, what a lot of providers do. Uh, in fact, I believe that's how Cloudflare has deployed it. Um, and not will soon supporting it, but not yet. <laughs> so it's, it's my, my not hungover drunk. Uh, not hung over a joke. Uh, in terms of cloud supporting services, uh, you can use Cloudflare or Google at this stage. Um, now, remember how I told you that it was uh, basically DNS packets wrapped up and then pushed into web requests? Well, um, Google decided that was dumb, so they invented their own standard. And uh, so now that's the same standard that Cloudflare uses, and it's not part of the specification how that works. It's just a JSON API, which is a lot more simpler and really probably what it should have been to start off with rather than just trying to bundle binaries into uh, binary data into base 64. Um, yeah, so the browser vendors are implementing it because they see they don't think operating system developers care enough about user privacy. Um, and they do care about user privacy. And of course, um, they believe, or at least they say it's going to be a performance increase as well. Um, they can do tricky things if they know what domains you're going to via these requests. They also know what domains you're going to be going to uh, in parallel with that, whether it be advertising sites or you know wherever they load JavaScript from or whatever. They can push those results to the browser before you ask for it. So um, that's where they think they're going to get those performance gains out of it. And also with HTTP push, they can push results out even if they don't know where you're going and preload you with some IP addresses um, based on perhaps previous browsing patterns, which did scare you a little bit. Um, when I was, uh, I went to RIPE, to the RIPE conference um, over in Europe earlier last year, and they had some, uh, it was expressed by people in the audience whether or not a user could consent to turning on, um, uh, could, could consent to turning on uh, DNS over HTTPS because consent requires that the user understands the implications of their actions. And so there was a bit of a tussle there uh, in the EU because there were some American providers who were saying, look, we really care about your privacy. You should definitely trust us with it. <laughs> and uh, someone in the EU stopped and said, well, I, I know what you know, the policy is for my local provider because we have legal protections you know, in, in Europe. And they were, you know, we're not totally stoked with an American company telling us how to do it. Okay, so, oh man, okay, I'm running slightly long, but that's all right. So what are the conclusions? Um, I know I've just s s talked to you about a whole bunch of different features that are super complicated and have a bunch of knobs and twiddles, but what should you be doing about it? Just maintain your network services. Keep them patched and up to date. So use modern DNS software. Stuff built in the last year is probably fine, but if you should, you probably should be on top of the security patching anyway, so you should be something, uh, running something new and you should have a patching schedule in place anyway, right? Turn on DNSSEC validation. In the immortal words of Shia LaBeouf, just do it, <laughs> okay? Start thinking about user privacy because if you let the users come up with how they're gonna implement privacy for themselves or you're gonna let the browser vendors decide what privacy is for you, then that's what you're gonna end up with unless you do something about it first. So maybe that's just having an answer when someone asks you the question. Maybe that's running DNS over TLS servers on your name servers. Um, but start thinking about it. I'm not saying I have the solution, but start thinking about it. Okay, were there any questions about that? Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> Google doo-doo.
DNS over TLS. They started on the 9th of January. You'll see oh, it on okay, their blog. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, you can go there. Um, the whole thing about part of this issue with TLS, which is so bizarre, is the, I, the IETF opted for port 853, which is eminently blockable. Yeah. Why they didn't go to 443 beats me with a stick. You know, they should have just gone to the same port that everyone else uses for HTTPS. The thing that about DNS over HTTPS that really should keep you awake up all night and beyond is that if I preload an answer in HTTPS, that might not exist in the DNS itself. And I have just invented a new namespace and polluted your browser. There are no rules in browser land as to the domain of discourse of a downloaded name. So what if I download a fake name for dogoogle.com, a fake resolution? How does your browser know whether I'm lying or not? That's the bit that gets us all worried. Um, there are two parts to all of this. New Zealand's doing great, apart from <coughs> Vodafone and <coughs> Vocus, about <laughs> DNSSEC. Because if you think about it, if you're going to trust the web PKI as being your only nature of trust on the internet, you're screwed every day of the year. Exactly. There's just no way around it. The only thing that's left is, is the DNS. DNSSEC is brilliant. It's really, really hard to fool it. But, as I said yesterday, and Internet NZ seem to be listening, the registrant registry relationship is critical. Because if I can weasel in there and do a false delegation, I am you, I own you, everyone's then screwed again. So DNSSEC is great, but it needs a lot more hardening in that delegation step in, in the administration of the DNS. Yeah. But nice talk, thanks. Thanks. Um, so yeah, just a, a couple of points there. I, th I think the reason they didn't choose 443 was because it's not HTTP, and the browser vendors would have got upset and said, how dare you use our port for something that's not HTTP, which has a certain amount of irony in it, right? <laughs> um, uh, what was your second thing? Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah, something that is conspicuously absent from my, from my talk was Dane. I don't know if you know about uh, Dane, which allows you to specify actual certificate fingerprints inside DNS for validation of browsers. And that's something no browser currently supports. Chrome had it for a little while, but they removed it for performance reasons. Um, it also apparently somehow breaks their security model for how security works on the internet if you can specify server records, which um, I, I find that a little bit baffling. Um, in terms of Internet NZ, I probably can't say too much because I'm not a policy person, but certainly security around registrar and registries uh, is something we do think about quite seriously. Um, we have some ideas in the pipeline, um, and so next time we come out and say, hey guys, is there something you think we should be doing? Definitely come and talk to us about it, or come and talk to me here at the conference because we do have some ideas, and if we have support from the community, it makes it a lot easier to do. Cool, any other comments or questions? Um, if you want, um, come up and ask me questions later on and or collect my limited edition business cards. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Okay, so that's morning tea. We've got half an hour and we'll see you back here at 11. <laughs>